Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good. Food's good? Yeah. How many people have been to Brazil in this group? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. How many people have heard of Brazil? <laughs> All right. How many people have heard of Capoeira? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do this evening, I have some notes and some slides and stuff like that. Um, but I just got back from two months in Bahia, and I'm still adjusting to being back. Those of you who have been there know what it's like, the cultural shock coming back. So I may switch into Portuguese while I'm talking, right. or I may just go off and think about what it was like to be on the beach. <laughs> but I want to do a couple of things. Um, the history of Capoeira is still being written. So I can only give you a little bit of it, right? Um, the idea of black consciousness is still evolving. So I can only give you a snapshot of that as well. But what I'd like to do is give you some information that I've learned on a journey. A journey I took that brought me here tonight. This journey started over 30 years ago when I first went to Brazil. And I went to Brazil to study capoeira. I didn't want to read books about capoeira. I wanted to see what it felt like to do capoeira. That's the difference, what it feels like and what it is. Fast forward 30 years later, I'm in front of you talking about capoeira and black consciousness. So I'm going to start with some notes. I'll be moving in and out. I'll do some theoretical stuff, some fun stuff. And let's see where it goes. To do my research, I needed a, a foundation. How am I going to look at what I'm going to see? Right? What's my perspective, my point of view? And I came across a scholar whose name is Fela Sawande. And he talks about folklore. And I'm going to point out a specific word in here that's going to come up throughout my remarks. So Phyllis Wandy said, the lore of the folk is properly understood as a body of knowledge given to a particular group by its divine teachers. Divine teachers. So we're moving out of the mundane world into the spiritual world. Communication of this deep secret knowledge is through symbols. The word I want you to keep in mind is symbols. And these symbols are for the inquirer to unravel <coughs> for self. And Phyllis Wandi ends with the proper teacher of any individual is that individual's soul. So we see we're at a, a different level. Not your mind, but your soul. And so there's this idea of being connected to the true self, to the soul. This is important as we move into studying African-based cosmology and philosophy. So that's our spiritual component as foundation. Our next slide talks about three phenomena that change the world's social and political order in the 20th century. Colonized, oppressed people of color, so-called minority people, won independence and continue to struggle against oppression. So we have all of the colonies of France and Britain achieving independence. At the same time, we have the emergence of the civil rights movement and the black power movement. We also have feminist challenge to patriarchy, and we have the environmentalist call for a more intelligent stewardship of the planet. So this began to change the world. 
the consciousness of the world. Those of you who are close to my age and were watching television when police beat people in Birmingham, Alabama, that opened your consciousness. That expanded your consciousness. All right. One of the things that was believed about Western social science was that it was objective. There were no biases. Until you begin to read about how Western social scientists looked at African-based and, and cultures of color. So I needed a new perspective and I came across the writings of an Afro-Brazilian, Abgeus Nascimento. Professor Nascimento was the first Afro-Brazilian to serve as a federal deputy in Brazil, as a congressperson and a senator. During the military uh, dictatorship, he was exiled. He came to the United States and taught at University of Buffalo, and then he taught at Temple University, where I was assigned to be his teaching assistant. What a great break. I'd be like learning to play trumpet with Dizzy Gillespie, <laughs> right? So I'm with Abgeus. So what does he say? This is our perspective, quilombismo. The Quilombos were camps, establishments, communities hidden away during enslavement. Africans would escape enslavement and run to the mountains or to the woods and set up these sites called Quilombos. So Quilombismo is a scientific, scientific historical philosophy whose focal point is the human being as an actor, first as an actor, and then as a subject within a worldview in which science constitutes one among many other paths to knowledge. So we like science. We can test it, test it again, it's reliable, we got proof. But what Quilombismo is telling us is that there are other paths to knowledge. One of the other paths to knowledge is intuition. And how does one increase their intuition? And how do we live in a world where men are so far removed from their intuition nowadays? Men don't feel. It's not good to be a man and to feel. Women feel, but women don't think so. <laughs> men are in charge. Now you see the, the insane reasoning I just went through. Everybody thinks, everybody feels, okay? So science is just one among many other paths to knowledge. What are these other paths to knowledge? Right. This is what I was looking for. Quilombismo is rooted in history, culture, and experience of the group. What group are we talking about? African descendants in Brazil. Or African descendants in Cuba. Or African descendants in North America. Professor Nascimento's wife, Elisa Nascimento, wrote a book called The Sorcery of Color, Identity, Race, and Gender in Brazil. Very timely study, I mean, would really fit into what's happening in our world today and in our country today as we look at the presidential elections setting up and what's being said about people, what's being said about the other. The other, the other who is not white and not male. Elisa says, the first and foremost task facing agents of social movements, let's call that social change, is the mobilization 
and manipulation of symbols. So remember earlier we saw this idea of symbol. And now we're coming back. If you're going to be about social movement, social change, you need to manipulate symbols. Okay? Our next slide talks about the location, the matrix, where Kapwita originated. West Central Africa. We call it Congo, Angola. Notice that Congo is spelled with a K, not a C. Right? Central Africa is one of the most dynamic forces in world culture. Now this phrase, dancing between two worlds, refers to a Bakongo belief. Bakongo are people who inhabited and inhabit Congo, Angola. A belief that existence is a constant movement or dance between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And we'll see a graph in a moment that'll go into that in a little more detail. But this idea that within African philosophy and cosmology, life recycles. We are reincarnated. All right. I'll leave this form and I'll be reborn into my family in the future. Okay. Now here's a graphic representation of part of the cos uh, Congo cosmogram. The universe is seen as a circle. The upper half of the circle is the land of the living. The lower half of the circle is the land of the dead. So we have Nsike and Mpemba. Dividing these worlds is the Kalunga line. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Going around this circle is the soul, called Moyo. So this Moyo, in a lifetime, goes around this circle. And you can see, if you're really looking, Moyo is close to the word Mojo. Right? Muddy Waters had a song, said, I got my Mojo working, but it's not working on you. He's saying, I'm working for my soul. It's just not working on you. Okay? Now, we're going to get a little more complicated in the next slide. Remember, this is the land of the living, the land of the dead. Here's the Kalunga line, the line that divides the worlds. And in this cosmology, it's believed that our life is divided into four critical moments. So this is called the four moments of the sun. As the sun travels through the universe, the soul go goes around. Musoni, and each of these is color co coordinated. Musoni is the period of conception. When something is conceived, it could be an idea to build a building, an idea to design a car. It could be the creation of new life. It matures to this point and it's born in Kala. It continues to grow and it reaches the high point in life, Takula. It's the most powerful point in life. And then it begins to, to descend to Luvemba and then finally down into Musoni again, where the soul is cleansed and prepared for rebirth. Okay, so that's the philosophical and cosmological foundation. All right. Now, when I went to Salvador Bahia in 1983, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know any of it existed. I went to see what, what it felt like to study Capoeira. And when I got there, this is what I found. Right? Okay. 
we talked about symbols. And what I'm trying to work on these days is to look at Brazilian art uh, from the 19th, 17th century, see what symbols are there, and then look forward to see what symbols are around now. So we see 1816, a funeral procession in Rio de Janeiro from the French artist Debray. And so we can see the body, we see marchers, and we see people who are a little bit separate from the parade. I want us to concentrate on this aspect of the painting. We see everyone, not everyone, but most people have feathers in their heads. And Songwa, let me start here, sorry. The staff. This leader is carrying an Songwa staff to honor the dead and to communicate with the spirit world. Again, so there's this idea of being able to communicate with the spirit world. Now in Sala, feathers. In Congo, feathers express ceaseless growth and they suggest connection with the other half of the cosmogram, the upper world. Remember that circle, remember the dividing line, feathers deal with the top part of that circle. Our next focus is here. Nelimonia Zibukwa, outstretched arms, crying for help, proclaiming, sending a positive force from the ancestors. And we're going to see this position again in a few moments. And then we're looking at something called Taking Kindu, walking on hands in the other world. Remember, this would be the Kalunga line. The ground would be the Kalunga line. Turn one's body, run, and turn it into a ball into the air. Taking Kindu. So we see this is 1816, Taking Kindu, outstretched arms, feathers. Okay? I was at a carnival rehearsal. Um, it was probably February the 7th this year. And this was one of the costumes. All right, we see the feather. Okay, now you can say, well, you don't, you don't know if that's really what it, what, you know, if it means what you say it means. I say, I, I'll let you have that one, right? But then we go to Gerhard Kubik. Scholar says, components of a cultural heritage can also be transmitted unconsciously between individuals. A trait sometimes disappears from the surface of a specific culture for a certain historical period. After some time, a need arises, the lost trait is reinvented, and probably in the New World, there's a lot of African culture material beneath the surface. So what Kubik is saying is that on an unconscious level, culture is transmitted to the next generation. And even if the young men who were wearing those feathers don't know the full significance of it, they are doing it. All right? They will learn the significance. Talking Kindle. Now we're looking at Capoeira. Remember the slide. Here we see one of the masters doing a hajole. Here we see a master, Cobra Mansa, doing a one-armed cartwheel. Remember, run, put yourself in a ball, throw your body in the air. Here's another talking kindle, two masters in a ball. And this one is, one standing up is defending himself. 
And here we see in the game of Capoeira a position called Shamada. And in the game of Capoeira, there's, a, there's a, a moment in the game where one of the players will stand up and expose himself like this. And in one sense, this is the most dangerous time in the game. But this is also the time when all of the trickiness and all of the, the term is malicia comes out. Because the other opponent drops back has to approach, and he can't approach in an aggressive or defensive way. And so they get together, and they're moving back and forth across the floor like this. Any movement will set this off. Something else will happen. Okay? The object of the game, if you don't know, is to either sweep your opponent off their feet or position them so that they can't defend themselves. That's the nice piece of it. But getting swept, I mean, you know, if you're moving really fast and somebody just sweeps you, you're going to land on your butt, right, with a thump. And sometimes if you don't get out the way, you get hit, all right? I remember we saw in that art piece the hands like this, right? It's also called Yangala Lala. The hands above the head with fingers spread wide signifies ecstasy and the presence of spirit. Yangala Lala. This Congo Atlantic gesture signifying ecstasy becomes a sign of victory for black athletes. All right? So we see how culture gets transmitted and it continues. All right? The Olympics are coming. Watch particularly the sprinters, the 100 yard dash men, the men who run the 200, and the women who run the 200 meter dash when they hit that. The winner, when they hit that finish line, it's like this. Watch the March Madness coming up. When that shot goes in, just as the butter go, bu buzzer goes off, you're going to see everybody do, do this. Right? OK. This is our last slide. And this ties in, I don't know how many people are going to the concert. It's going to be a multimedia event. But this slide says, music is the unseen healing <coughs> power, the medium most appropriate for addressing God. Dancing, drumming, and singing are spiritual medicine in Kisi. They provide inner balance and allow participants and community members to learn social patterns and values. All three heal the individual or group. It is the musician who receives and transmits energy from the spiritual world. All right. So in Congo, this is the role of the magician, of musician. All right, to contact the spiritual world and help heal the community. Okay. Still not at the point of how I got here. So I, I went to Brazil. I studied capoeira and I began to meet people. And one of the teachers that I met, her name is Makota Valgina. And I met her probably two days after I got there. I, I couldn't speak any Portuguese, right? Nothing. And I'm staying in a, a woman house. And I was at that point saying, 
why did I do this to myself? Right? So she was my contact person, called her. She said, listen, you don't have to stay here. You can come and stay with my family. And that opened the doors for everything in Salvador for me. In living with her family, I, I was really culturally prepared when I got to Brazil. I had studied Yoruba culture. I knew how to drum. I knew how to dance. I was ready. Except my coat of Algina taught me about Congo, Congo Angola culture, right? So very early on, and I was probably one of the first, if not the first, African Americans in my generation to begin to look at Congo Angola culture in Brazil. We didn't, have, we didn't talk about Yoruba stuff. We didn't talk about Christian stuff. We talked about Congo, Angola. This is this, this is this, this is this. And then I could begin to make comparisons. I stayed in Bahia about maybe two months. Again, I still couldn't speak any Portuguese. I, um, and I came home and started processing what had happened and I began to meet other people. I met people who had produced um, documentaries on Capoeira. There was a world conference on African religions in Bahia. So in a sense, there was this sort of, you all know about the Harlem Renaissance? It was sort of a renaissance happening in Bahia. And there were a group of young, educated artists, dancers, scholars, who were all meeting at the same point in time, coming from all over. New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Miami. Didn't know each other yet, but we get to this point, and this sort of this implosion, this understanding, this raising of Congo culture in Brazil. You, go to, you can go to Salvador today, and if you're not in the right circles, all you're going to hear is Yoruba, 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 right? More and more and more, you're starting to hear about Congo culture. As I said, we had um, world conferences on African religion, more and more people began to become part of the network. And more importantly, African Americans, intellectuals, began undergoing their initiations. All right? Which is the full commitment to being in the culture. There's this notion of what initiation does to you or for you. The sense that those who are initiated see the world differently. There's an absolute process that takes place on your being that allows you to see the world differently. All right, you see, we talked about symbols. We talked about intuition. Now, I'm, I'm sure you all have heard of psychics and what, what not, whether you believe that or not, that's your business. But you know that, that that thought, that concept is out there, right? And there are, there are people who have been initiated or born into these traditions that when you walk into a room, they know everything about you. They can see your happiness. They can see your sadness. The power of initiation, of those initiated, 
the role, I should say, is to heal. It's not to amass power, to control anything, but to heal. Let me give you a sense. You all look great tonight. How's that feel? Great. All right. Using the word to heal. So I can use words to hurt. I can use words to heal. All right. So the power of initiation is to heal. I'm coming to black consciousness. Just, just hold on. What we have now is that we had all these forces coming together from all over. We had Makota Valgina here. We had the Caribbean Cultural Center here. I'm walking around trying to learn how to speak Portuguese. <laughs> and I don't, I don't remember how we met, but I met Mestre Cobra Mansa, Cobrinha. He was Cobrinha when we met. And um, we laugh and joke about it now. Uh, he, there's a, a praça, a, a plaza in, in Salvador, Praça da Sé. And Cobrinha used to have a, he set up a, a bike wheel, no tire on it, just a wheel, just a rim. And he had these knives in it all the way around. And it was on a stand, right? And he was selling something, I don't know what it was, because my Portuguese wasn't that good. And those of you who have been to Brazil, you know when you want to get somebody's attention, what do you do? In, a, in North America, we would say that's rude. But down there, it's, it's happening. So Cobra would call people, pss, pss, and he would come, and he was selling some kind of snake oil or something like that. And he would dive through this hoop. Now, I've never seen him do it. They tell me he's done it. Why do I mention him? Because in my opinion, he's probably, he's probably the hippest Copperware master on the planet right now. Why is that? He has a sustainable farm of at least 50 acres in Valencia where people who are tired of this madness go down there, live in nature. They don't have internet there. I don't think they have telephone. They grow their own food. It's self-sustaining. And I asked him, um, we were together February. I said, um, I said, Cobra, why do you like farming? He said, I, I've loved it since I was a child. Now, he uses capoeira to sustain the farm, right? I asked him, well, Cobra, um, you've created this international capoeira Angola foundation. You have 38 chapters around the world, around the world, right? What does this mean for you, right? And so he's telling me that it has the potential to raise people's consciousness because essentially Kapawede teaches you how to live a good life. Western science has seen it as a game, a dance, a fight. Quilombismo sees it as a way of living a proper life. If you see a hold of capoeira, the game being played, the two Opponents kneel in front of the master, they shake hands, they play the game, somebody gets kicked or swept, somebody gets faked out, people laugh after the game. What do they do? No hard feelings, they shake hands. All right, so you can't hold on to bad feelings. Get past it. 
What else does it teach you? It teaches you to be able to perform when the world turns you upside down. Every movement that you make on foot, you need to be able to make standing on your hands, every kick, right? And particularly in Angola, you know, you're, up, you're like this on the ground, right? And so you have to be able to see the world in two ways. Whatever you learn in practice and in the Hoda, you take out of the Hoda and incorporate that into your life, okay? As we studied the history of Kapawita, it took us to Central Africa and it took us to foot fighting techniques because what we heard initially was Kapawita is um, uh, a martial art disguised as a dance and um, the enslaved used it to uh, escape from freedom. A part of that's true, but that's the oral history. The fuller history is that if we look at world history, all people had warriors and the way of fighting in Central Africa was with feet. There were games played, kicking games. This, we're finding out, becomes the matrix for, for Capoeira. So Cobra Mansa has um, done a film called um, Body Games, where he goes to South Africa and he talks with the elders. And he finds people who do these old games, old people. And he sits down and he gets their stories. And this, this film, um, I think, is going to be shown probably in June here. All right, keep that in mind. So as we're growing over these last 30 years, the sensibility of African-American um, scholarship enters in to the sensibility of Afro-Brazilian culture. And we begin looking out and we see that, wow, these, the same people who came to Brazil went to Cuba. They went through various places in the Caribbean, and all these places have foot fighting martial arts. When folks in Brazil heard this, they just took off, right? And to remember, both African-Americans, Af Afro-Brazilians are not 200 years out of enslavement. Couldn't teach us to read, couldn't teach us to write. And so we get to the 1950s and 1960s and there are very few folks of African descent in this country who, speak port who spoke Portuguese. Right. So how do you begin to investigate the records? So one of the things I tell my students, listen, you need, you need at least three languages. English, Spanish, or Portuguese, one other. So that you can communicate one-on-one -on -one with people. It's, it's one thing to read a book. It's another thing to get out in that circle and play copper with it. It's another thing to pick up a Pandero and try to play. Pandero is the hardest thing to play in the world. That little thing is about this big, and after about, Ed, tell the truth, after about two minutes, it about, weighs about 20 pounds, doesn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> <laughs> so, this coming together of all of these different forces, my Cota Valgina, and me, and the Caribbean Cultural Center, and Cobra Mansa, and the emergence of GCAP, and Fika begins to change the consciousness, not of everybody, just people who are in our community and have 
the similar vision. Just those people. We didn't do any of this to pro uh, proselytize. I didn't go into this to become Dr. Dasser. I went into this, why? I wanted to go to Brazil and feel what it was like to train copper with it. That was it. And that's what brought me here, going to Brazil to feel. So I want to tell you a little bit about, and on this note, you can hear the, them rehearsing something called the Manjinga experiment. And the word Manjinga means magic. And in the Capoeira songs, there's a, a verse that says, Eu sou manjinguero. I'm a magician. When you go to Brazil, particularly by here, you see the magic. You feel the magic. I'm going to give you one. Can I, can I tell just a little bit of story? A little teeny one? So I'm, you know, I, my Portuguese is, right? And, um, but I'm on it. I'm searching for Capoeira Angola. And I'm, I'm going here, I'm going there. I'm in the museum. Afro Museum, and I see the pictures. There's Mestri Pachina, who really codified Capoeira Angola. I see him, I see his performance group. And I'm running around getting e interviews, and I'm, I'm hoping that folks speak English. Right? So I met with this one director of a cultural center. She said, Ken, if you want to do something on Capoeira, you need to run. The masters are dying. What am I going to do, right? She said, find the wife of Mestri Pashtinya. She'll talk to you. How do I do that, right? So I'm come out of the place, a couple of days pass. I'm in the Tejero de Jesus. Just a little bit from the Praça da Sé. And the cars, you know, Crossing the street in Brazil is dangerous. Really, really. Pedestrians do not have the right of way, ever. So the cars would come in and shoo, shoo, and you'd, you know. So I'm trying to get across the street and there's this energy next to me. And this lady is raising hell. She's cussing people out. And what she was saying is that they won't, let, they won't let an old lady cross the street. And so then she turned to me and she said, isn't that right? So I knew that much Portuguese, right? <laughs> so I, you know, I, I go into my American act. I don't speak Portuguese. That slows people down, you know, they, oh, poor, poor, poor you. So she did like this. Where are you from? I said, the United States. She said, well, why are you here? I said, I'm, I'm here to um, study Capoeira Angola. She said, oh, yeah? I'm the wife of Mestri Pashtinha. <laughs> you come to my house tomorrow. I'll have lunch ready for you. That's the magic. Eu sou manjinguero. Thank you so much. <laughs>